It was the most potent symbol of American air power in military history. Designed to fend off ferocious attacks of the German Luftwaffe, it dealt a death blow to Nazi wartime industrial production and raised Hitler's capital to the ground. To me, it was the most beautiful thing ever built. Got a great plane, still is. Each crewed by 10 men, thousands of them would fly the most perilous missions of the Second World War. Many would never return. If it hadn't have been for a B-17, I more likely wouldn't be sitting here talking to you. Using color reenactments and rare archive film, Battle Stations takes to the skies in the legendary B-17 Flying Fortress. Nineteen eighteen, with the conclusion of the war to end all wars, military powers around the world recognized that warfare would never be the same. Military thinking moved away from the stalemate of trench warfare and focused on the use of the new wonder weapons, aircraft. It had become apparent that bombers would prove decisive in any future conflict. The bomber, it was believed, would always get through. In the 1930s, this bomber doctrine gathered real momentum. Attention now turned to modernizing America's obsolescent air corps. Modern bombers were needed to replace the fabric and wooden aircraft of the last war. On August the 8th, 1934, the US Army Air Corps issued a circular proposal that called for a bomber with a maximum speed of 250 miles per hour. It must operate at 10,000 feet and have a range of 2,000 miles. Designs would be company funded and submitted for testing within the year. The Victor would win a production run of 220 aircraft. Teetering on the brink of bankruptcy, the Boeing Aircraft Company leapt at the challenge. In a bold move, Boeing, under the visionary leadership of Edward C. Wells, committed most of its capital and manpower to the project they called Model 299. It was a fantastic gamble. In August 1934, Boeing began building a radical, all-metal, four-engined aircraft. It had uh, beautiful lines. It was a low-wing airplane. It had uh, all the turrets were, were attractive. It was just a nice-looking airplane. And Boeing has always been noted for making beautiful airplanes. Boeing's new plane would be fitted with an array of machine guns and an internal weapons bay. It was a bold design, one that far exceeded the requirements of the proposal. On July the 28th, 1935, just 11 months after the competition had started, Boeing's Model 299 rolled out of the company's factory in Seattle, becoming America's first all-metal, four-engine bomber. Closely guarded, the Army's newest bomber and America's largest land plane is prepared for its first flight at Seattle. It's Boeing 299. Note her machine gun turrets. The ship weighs 15 tons and is reported to have cost nearly half a million. A newspaper reporter attending the event was impressed by the immense size and the number of gun emplacements on the aircraft and exclaimed, why, it's a flying fortress. Well, my father used to say, look at all that armor you got. And I said, Dad, you could put your finger through the side of the airplane if you really pushed real hard. It was just an aluminum box flying in the sky, is all it was, with some guns sticking out of it with a load of bombs, you know, like a paper bag. <laughs> with all of the hardware and all the guns that it had on it, it truly was a flying fortress. Boeing's legendary aircraft was born. But the all-important contract was still to be won. Alongside Boeing's offering, two rival twin-engine designs were also evaluated by the Army Air Corps, Martin's B-12 and Douglas's DB-1. On the morning of the 30th of October, disaster struck. During evaluation, the Boeing prototype bomber stalled after takeoff and crashed at right field. 
the Boeing Aircraft Company had invested uh, in the Model 299 project without any commitment from the Army Air Corps, uh, and now the program lay in tatters. In addition, uh, they lost their two pilots, uh, which effectively put them out of running for the contract. Boeing's Model 299 was disqualified from the competition, and the company lost the contract. Douglas's DB-1 triumphed, and 133 of the bombers were ordered. But despite the crash, Model 299 had impressed the Air Corps, and a small number were purchased for further evaluation. It was not the order Boeing had hoped for, but it was a start. Modifications to the aircraft followed, and in February 1937, the Air Corps ordered 10 more aircraft, now called YB-17s. These aircraft, fitted with superchargers, had a ceiling of 30,000 feet. But in the dark days of September 1939, as Europe descended into war, Douglas's bombers were taking too long to get off the production lines and were proving underpowered. Boeing's B-17 was the only operational heavy bomber in the United States, but the Air Corps owned just 30. New YB-17s would now be fitted with power-operated turrets above and below the fuselage, and two more sets of twin guns were added to the tail and radio operator's positions. By March 1941, B-17s were being transformed from an advanced prototype to a full-powered superbomber ready for war. Under the terms of its Lend-Lease agreements, America sent 20 of these fortress YB-17s to Britain's Royal Air Force. But the B-17's first delivery flight ended in disaster. At high altitude over the skies of England, the bomber experienced a power failure and crashed. It was an inauspicious start. But despite its problems, on the 8th of July, 1941, two Fortress Ones belonging to the RAF bombed Wilhelmshaven in Germany. Wilhelmshaven, the main target, is a number one target, for it's a major naval base and a great shipbuilding center. This first mission also ended in disaster. At high altitude, all of the guns froze, and the bombs were dropped wide of the target. Later, eight Fortress Ones were shot down. It looked as though the B-17 would go down in history as a failure. The British experience of the Fortress One was a resounding failure. The aircraft was found to suffer from a number of mechanical failures. Uh, the guns froze when at high altitude. Uh, it lacked defensive armament to fight off a determined attack by the enemy. And it was also difficult to put ordnance on target uh, from that high. The RAF therefore concluded that the best thing would be to increase its defensive armament, use it in greater numbers for uh, protective purposes, uh, and also to use it at lower altitudes. Now the RAF immediately pulled the fortress from European combat and promptly reassigned it to the Middle East. As war intensified in Europe and diplomatic relations between the USA and Japan deteriorated, America moved its YB-17s to bases in the Pacific. On the 7th of December, 1941, as a flight of unarmed YB-17s arrived at Hickam Field, Hawaii, Japan ended America's isolationism. At Pearl Harbor, 12 B-17s were destroyed on the ground and all of the unarmed aircraft flying in were damaged or lost. From the ashes of the destruction in Hawaii, America's troubled B-17s had to prove its doubters wrong. With America at war, the Flying Fortress is about to be thrown into the thick of the action. In the desperate days following Pearl Harbor, as America rushed headlong into war, production of YB-17s went into full swing. On December the 8th, 1941, Boeing executive Jake Harmon made a phone call to Plant 2 at Seattle. His conversation was concise and to the point. Start building airplanes. How many? Just start building. Never mind the schedules. 
Tell us how much money and what things you need and when. As Harman made his call, B-17s in the Pacific started flying reconnaissance missions to track the Japanese battle fleet. Off the coast of Luzon, a Japanese convoy was spotted. Five YB-17s attacked, and the Flying Fortress became the first US aircraft to drop its bombs in World War II. But it was in Europe that the fortress would become a legend. By early 1942, in accordance with the Allied Europe First policy, Major General Karl Spatz suggested that the 8th Air Force be designated the core of the Army Air Forces in Britain. Now America prepared to send its new heavies to frontline units in England. Recognizing the value of bombing to the war in Europe, Britain's Prime Minister Winston Churchill and President Franklin Roosevelt agreed on the use of air power in the theater. Churchill and Roosevelt both unequivocally endorsed strategic bombing. In January 1943, they had called for the unconditional surrender of Germany and Japan, and they saw strategic bombing as the overwhelming force that would quickly end the war. By destroying the German industrial complex and demoralizing its civilian population, they reasoned that they could grind to a halt Hitler's war machine. Early in 1942, Allied command identified special targets to be given absolute priority. Submarine construction facilities, aircraft factories, ball-bearing production plants, and oil refineries were at the top of the list. The RAF and 8th Air Force planned a coordinated non-stop day and night bomber offensive. From then on, B-17s would operate by day in full view of the German Luftwaffe. Flying a B-17 in combat without a fighter escort was pretty close to being suicidal. It wasn't until they learned the lesson the hard way that you can't fly these airplanes. They were just not well protected because the enemy that we were contending with was highly sophisticated, good weapons and good airplanes. On August the 17th, 1942, the US launched its first raid of the war in Europe. With no fighter cover, the B-17s made the attack on their own. At 1526 hours, the first daylight mission from a base in England was launched. Strategic air power was born. As B-17s were to be operated without fighter escort, great emphasis was placed on flying in a defensive wedge formation. By stacking the aircraft in an orderly pattern, it was believed that their arcs of fire would be enough to repel fighter attacks, but this theory would be severely tested. We in the United States, uh, the, uh, the Army Air Corps at that time, had no tactics. They didn't know how to go at it. And our adversary over in uh, Germany, they'd been fighting and flying since 1939. So they were old hands at what we were just learning. You have the high squadron, you had the low squadron, and the middle squadron. You flew in a formation basically like this. The tighter you flew, and the reason for tight formation is that the fighters could not go through your formation and break it up, which they would attempt to do. No matter what angle a fighter came at you from, he had a lot of 50 caliber machine guns shooting at him because of the way the formation was stacked, almost every gunner on the right side of the aircraft, for instance, could, could shoot at the fighter. Though the unescorted bombers had some protection against fighters, there was nothing they could do to avoid Flieger Abwehr Kanonen, flak. Fired from the ground, these lethal 88 mm shells were set to explode at the same altitude as the aircraft. Once the German gunners zeroed in on the B-17s, the results could be devastating. I always thought that flak was uh, more dangerous than fighters were because you could see a fighter coming and you could shoot back, but you never knew when you might get hit by the flak shell, and there was lots of it. They used to say the flak smoke was so thick you could walk on it up there, and that was almost true. 
Well, anti-aircraft is like going down a bumpy road with a car with no shock absorbers on it, and every time the, shell, the thing would go off, you'd be bumping, jump up and down. I mean, you're going this way, you're going right, you're going left, you're going up and down. In January 1943, Churchill and Roosevelt met at the Casablanca Conference and agreed policy on the strategic bombing campaign. In what became known as the Casablanca Directive, the 8th Air Force was given the responsibility to ensure the progressive destruction and dislocation of the German military, industrial, and economic system. But flying unescorted in daylight hours posed a real threat to the bomber's crews. Flying at a mere 200 miles per hour, the B-17s were sitting ducks for the German Luftwaffe. At 30,000 feet, the crews of the unpressurized B-17s operated in extreme conditions. Encumbered by bulky clothing, engaging an enemy fighter was no easy task. It's 55 below zero up there, and uh, even though we had heaters in the cockpit, the, the four gunners back in the rear, uh, they had no heat. And uh, even though they wore heated suits, some of them, uh, and wore a lot, of, uh, a lot of clothing, it was still very cold back there, and frostbite was a problem for them. The biggest thing people don't realize, people sweat at 45 degrees below zero. You sit there sweating. Maybe it was fair sweat, I don't know. The crews had good reason to be fearful, as German pilots identified a weakness in the aircraft's defenses. A frontal attack, concentrating on the nose with its minimal armor, was the best way to down a heavy. Well, when we first got there, uh, they'd make most of their attacks from the tail. And that didn't bother the pilots because we couldn't see them. <laughs> then about halfway through, well, they switched to the head-on stuff. And it wasn't just one plane coming head-on, it was a whole flight, like four to six planes coming in. They had more guts than Dick Tracy, I'll tell you. It, it amazed me that one of these guys could take a one ME 109 and fly right through the middle of your group. You knew that they were showing off, they were trying to scare the heck out of you, and they were doing it. The head-on attacks by the German airplanes would shoot out the people in the nose. It was a vulnerable position. They would get the pilots or get the bombardier or get the navigator. In April 1943, during an attack on a Fokker Wolf plant at Bremen, 16 B-17s were destroyed, the heaviest loss rate to date. But for the 8th Air Force, things were about to go from bad to worse. On August the 17th, American forces planned to attack the ball bearing factories at Schweinfurt. The factories at Schweinfurt produce 52% of the total number of anti-friction bearings manufactured in Germany. This concentration of critical production capacity caused the Allied Chiefs of Staff to assign a top priority to the target. The Germans, of course, were determined to defend the place because it was important. And so they put every fighter up that they could get a hold of, I guess. And they did, uh, they did some real bad damage to the 8th Air Force that day. Of the 211 fortresses dispatched on the raid, 60 were lost, over a quarter of the attacking force. The attrition rate in, in uh, crewmen on B-17s was extremely high. And in the early days, uh, your chance of survival was one in three. That's a sobering experience to know that you have to fly 25 missions and your chance of survival was just almost nil. By 1943, the U.S. 8th Air Force in Britain suffered the highest attrition rate of the war. Less than a third of B-17 crews were expected to survive. At this rate, the 8th Air Force would only last another few weeks. Something needed to be done, and quickly. The huge losses suffered by the 8th Air Force in August 1943 nearly ended the American daylight bombing offensive in Europe. Realizing that its loss rate was unsustainable, the Army Air Force halted its offensive to rethink and regroup. 
For the crews of the B-17s, it was an opportunity to familiarize themselves with the aircraft and form bonds that would last a lifetime. There's 10 men in the, in the crew, uh, four officers, a pilot and a co-pilot, a navigator and a bombardier, they were officers. All the rest were enlisted men. Each man had his own battle station on the aircraft. The navigator and, and the bombardier were in the nose of the aircraft. And uh, you, you call through a hatch, and then you go up into the pilot's compartment. Here, the pilot, co-pilot, and flight engineer had their stations. Quite naturally, the pilot and co-pilot were real buddies because they had to look at each other side by side and they had to make sure that all of these buttons were punched and all of this electric and all this hydraulics was functioning and everything. So they were very, very close. It needed to be. And then the engineer, when he wasn't manning his turret, would stand between the pilot and co-pilot and read off airspeed indicators and that kind of stuff. Behind the cockpit, in his own room, was the radio operator. He had a little space in there. It's kind of like a room, and he had all his radios and everything set up there. Further back, behind the radio operator, the ball turret gunner had a slightly smaller room, all of his own. Well, if, if you ever open a can of sardines, you know how it looks. It's all full. And the ball turret was that way. I wouldn't get in that ball turret if they gave me the airplane. <laughs> I don't know how else to put it. The guys that got in there, I think, deserved a, a medal just for doing it. Behind the ball, in the largest compartment of the fortress, the two waste gunners kept up a constant vigil for enemy fighters. And then you had your tail gunner. That added up to your 10 people. I depend on you. You're the pilot. You depend on me because I'm a gunner. And et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Each position has a responsibility to the other guys. It was a very close-knit little family. I mean, everybody had to do their job. Everybody depended upon the other guy to do his job. If somebody failed to do his job, something could go wrong. In picturesque rural England, surrounded by friendly civilians, the young American airmen of the 8th Air Force adjusted to life on the front line. Many would not survive the war, but in the tranquil surroundings of the English countryside, there were plenty of opportunities to make the most of their tour. Well, to say the least, coming from a big city like Chicago, it was, uh, it was it, there was like a culture shock. Of course, we had to buy a bicycle. It's the only way we could get around over there. And without their help, we couldn't even have found a place to buy a bicycle. And there was no shortage of American money. The shortage was in finding something to buy to spend our money. You usually got yourself a bicycle as soon as you got over there. And we would ride that seven miles into Oundel uh, in the evening and, uh, and hit the pub and have a few pints of mild and bitter or nut brown or whatever and uh, fraternize with the Brits. One of the expressions they used was the only problem with the Yanks was they were oversexed and overpaid and over there. And uh, we heard this once in a while. We were doing the same thing their guys were doing. And the kids got close to us because they'd be coming looking for gum chew, they're looking for candy, because you had no sugar, you had nothing like that. And we were, we're not a heck of a lot older than some of those kids. Maybe they were six or seven years old and we were 19 or 20 years old. We're kind of like their big brothers. A tour of duty in England was 25 missions. But with an average life expectancy of just 14 missions for a B-17 crew in the European theater, many would not survive. We had to fly 25 missions, and they told us, OK, all you have to do is fly 25 missions, you go back to the States. Right now, we're currently running a 4% attrition rate. Four times 25 is no go, you know? But uh, that, that's how bad it was. Studies carried out in 1943 show all too clearly that about half of the B-17s lost in combat had left the safety of the formation. The conclusion was that a B-17 on its own stood little chance of survival. In 1944, 
Efforts were made to revise the standard bomber combat formation, and a new 36-plane formation was devised. Three clusters, each consisting of 12 B-17s, replaced the existing 18-strong grouping. Flying in a V-shaped echelon, the aircraft were packed tightly together in the sky. Never before could the massed ranks of the B-17s concentrate firepower with such accuracy and volume. But flying so close together provided new dangers. When you're flying very tight formation and a plane within the formation, let's say got a direct hit and the thing blew up, he take quite a few other airplanes with it, and that did happen. What you were supposed to do was to back off a little bit and not fly so close, uh, unless you were under fighter attack. Now, if you were under fighter attack, well, then you were supposed to really get up there close and get a concentrated firepower. In the busy skies over Europe, accidents could and did happen. I looked off to the left, and here were two B-17s that had collided. And we saw one cut the other one in half, and the tail go one way, the plane go another way, and the other plane go to the right. And we looked out, saw these fellows falling out of the waist with no parachutes. The sad thing that happened was that the tail gunner bailed out, and he did, he did not have his chute hooked to the harness when he bailed out. It was a chest chute. He just had it in his hand, and the slipstream tore it away from him. So he had 27,000 feet to fall with no, no support. My thought was he had plenty of time to say his prayers before he hit. By the end of 1943, the latest model of the B-17 had additional mountings for handheld machine guns in the cheek of the aircraft and a power-operated turret in the chin. This G model was the last and most extensively produced version of the fortress, boasting a total armament of 13 50 caliber machine guns, transforming the B-17 from a tough bomber to a true fortress. After the disastrous Schweinfurt raids in August and September 1943, deep penetration raids into Germany were halted. The arrival of the P-51 Mustang, a single-seat long-range fighter, meant that the fortresses would at last have the additional protection they so badly needed. By December, the B-17 was ready for re-entry into European operations. Now the Allies concentrated on delivering a knockout blow to the Nazi war machine. By February 1944, the Army Air Force was ready to begin its attack against the German aircraft manufacturing industry. By destroying the Luftwaffe and the factories, it would be possible to conduct further strikes against other strategic targets. It was to be the biggest bombing missions yet, some 3,500 aircraft, all to bomb within the space of a week that would soon become known as the Big Week. For the crews of the B-17s, this big week began much the same as any other. Breaking the tree, breaking at four. You start in the middle of the night, actually, to go to the briefing, and they would put a yarn deal across a map up there from our field to where the target was. And most of the time, it looked like it was going halfway around the world. There were certain cities that if if they pull the curtain back at the briefing in the morning and you saw the string go into that place, why, well, you, you knew you were in for it. When they pulled that curtain back up there to show you where you were going, you should have heard the moaning and groaning from all the crews that were out there listening. The cost of the big week was heavy. 244 bombers and 33 fighter planes were lost. 2,600 men were killed or wounded in just seven days. It was living hell. <laughs> it was bad going in there and coming back. That's the most flak I ever saw in one place. That was the heaviest, the heaviest defense I had ever seen in my life. 
These raids played a crucial role in helping to reduce the overall strength of the Luftwaffe, paving the way for D-Day. During the offensive, the back of the Luftwaffe was broken. Now the B-17 crews could turn their attention to the most perilous bombing mission of them all, Berlin. Hermann Göring, commander-in-chief of the Luftwaffe, had claimed that enemy bombs would never fall on Berlin, and he had good reason to believe it. As Hitler's capital and the heart of the Nazi war machine, Berlin was the most heavily defended city in all of Fortress Europe. It was ringed by tens of thousands of lethal 88mm anti-aircraft guns and fighters. But by early 1944, production of new fighters had all but dried up. Now, the US Army Air Force concentrated on destroying the remnants of the Luftwaffe. By committing to daylight bombing raids over Berlin, the US 8th Air Force would face down the Luftwaffe in the skies above the Reich's capital. It would be a decisive battle, and a bloody one. But if the propaganda value of hitting the German capital in broad daylight was enormous, so were the risks and the crews of the B-17s knew that they would be the targets of highly trained German fighter pilots. German fighters were a big problem, I'll tell you. And there were a lot of them. And these guys have been flying since 1939. And they had the tactics down perfect. They'd come right at you, roll over, come on out, come back up again. <laughs> there was a group of German fighters yellow-nosed fox wolves, the Abbeville kids, we called them. Those guys were sharp, really sharp. We hated to see those things get in the air because they were good pilots. To make a successful bombing run, the B-17s relied on their bombardier and a top-secret device known as the Norden bombsite. The Norden bombsite was, was basically a computer, a mechanical computer. It was a unique piece of equipment. It was classified at the time, but we had a set of crosshairs in it. And my job was to put the crosshairs on the target and keep them on the target. Now the other factor would be in drift, so our wind would affect the drifting of the airplane, and my job was to kill the drift and keep making adjustments into our heading to the point where crosshairs would not drift off the target. They used to say they could drop them in a pickle barrel from 10,000 feet, but that was, that was fiction. It wasn't that good. But they did some very good bombing. Over Berlin, the B-17s would have to fly straight and level through the heaviest flak barrage imaginable before the bombardier could release his bombs accurately. The bombardier actually flew the airplane on the bomb run. Uh, the, the airplane would be put on an automatic pilot, and his bomb site would automatically compute the angle that the bomb should drop. Uh, it would do a very good job of getting the bomb on the target. What will drive you up a wall is if whoever that lead bombardier is up there goes over the target and doesn't drop. Then you make a 360 degree circle around and come back over the target again. And you gotta go through that same flak all over again. And if you could, you'd get out there and beat that guy half to death. <laughs> Nicknamed the Big B by the crews of the B-17, the heavies of the 8th Air Force prepared for a grim attrition fight over Berlin. For many, it would be their last mission of the war. On March the 4th, 1944, William Menzies was on his way to Berlin. And I called the top Turk and I says, we got fighters coming in. He says, no, no, they're ours. I can see the contrails. I said, below them, look at them. And about that time they opened up. I said, what the hell do you think? Those are landing lights. They're, sh they're shining at us. You've become only one person on that whole airplane. They're all after you. That's what I'm saying. When they're shooting at you, you're in the smallest part of the airplane. But that point still ends right between your eyes, you know, like an ice, an inverted ice cream cone. I saw somebody go out, and I got on my intercom to find out what was happening, and I had no intercom. I thought, well, I better find out what's happening. So I left my guns because uh, they weren't doing me too much good. And I crawled out of my gun position. I crawled through there with my harness on. I'd left my parachute where it was. 
There was one guy laying in the waist. His chute was pulled, but uh, he wasn't moving, so I assumed he was dead. It's Smitty, my co-pilot, and I could see him down on the bomb bay. I don't know if he's getting ready to jump or not, and he says, you know, like that. I assumed he said to go. Well, I couldn't go. My chute was back in the tail, so I turned around, I crawled back, and as I was crawling back in, I hooked my harness on something, and I backed up. I couldn't get off of it. I went forward, I couldn't get off of it, and panic filled a set in now. I got talking to the man upstairs in a hurry. I told him I'd even go back to church or he gets me out of this one. When people up front leave, and they, it's time for me to leave. I didn't want to be in it if it starts to spin. I'd made up my mind I wasn't going to be in it if I ever hit the ground. William Menzies parachuted safely away from the aircraft, but was captured. For him, the war was over. On March the 4th, 1944, the B-17s pounded a suburb of Berlin, and two days later revisited the city. But this second raid was costly. 69 bombers were shot down over the city, the largest loss of heavies the 8th Air Force had suffered on a single raid. But the men of the 8th had fought hard. 160 German fighters were destroyed, and Berlin was in flames. In the sustained and ruthless bombardment, Boeing's flying fortresses reduced almost 60% of the city to rubble. But the crews of the B-17s had little time for remorse. Our war was up there with the fighters where, you know what I'm saying? I'm not trying to make little of this. I'm just saying that's the way we looked at it. This was our war, five miles in the sky. Down in there, we, we didn't even, I didn't consider that people were dying. Out of the smoky haze of the Battle for Berlin emerged an icon of the American air war in Europe, the B-17 Flying Fortress. With Berlin in ruins, and the Luftwaffe down to a mere token force, the B-17s and their crews were given a new target, one that would end the war in Europe once and for all. By early 1944, German oil production, the lifeblood of the Reich's war machine, had remained largely immune to the air war. Though the Allies had already attempted to knock out the oil production facilities of Ploesti in Romania, German synthetic oil supplies continued to be produced. At the end of March 1944, when final plans for the Allied invasion of Europe were being drawn up, about 30% of the total petroleum available to Germany came from the refineries at Ploesti in Romania. At the beginning of 1944, following the systematic destruction of the German aircraft manufacturing industries, the strategic bombing target became oil. Oil and lubricants are the uh, lifeline of any army, and the Army Air Force reasoned that by striking oil production sites, uh, the enemy could be hampered in its ability to wage war. With its oil reserves, Hitler's war machine could and would fight on. As a matter of urgency, plans were put in place to smash Germany's fuel production. Once again, the B-17 flying fortresses would be in the front line. On May the 12th, 1944, the American attacks on German oil production began. During the month, strategic bombers dropped some 5,100 tons of bombs on oil targets. In August, the tonnage skyrocketed to 26,300 tons, and in November, it reached a climax. No less than 35,000 tons of heavy-duty explosives were dropped on crucial oil installations. But the offensive was taking its toll. In the first three months against these oil targets, the 8th lost 922 heavies, a staggering number. Another 10,000 men would never make it home. The defense of those targets was, was immense. If I recall, there was a, something on the order of 3,300 anti-aircraft guns around Leipzig at the end of the war. 
What happened with the Germans is they would pull all their anti-aircraft guns back in as they start losing territory. So the latter part of the war, it wasn't fighters that were your major opposition, it was anti-aircraft, because they had the concentration of those guns. And those 88s would come right there with us. By September, German fuel production was down to a quarter of its normal capacity. The remnants of the Luftwaffe were grounded, out of fuel, and became target practice for the B-17's escort fighters. Fighters returning from unchallenged escort missions were ordered to seek targets of opportunity. Since the enemy did not come up to fight, down they went to blast his planes and burn them in his airdromes. 500 enemy aircraft were being destroyed each week, many of them on the ground. By late November 1944, almost the entire might of the 8th Air Force was directed at destroying German oil facilities. Leading from the front, the B-17 spearheaded what the Reich's armaments minister Albert Speer called the end of German armament production. Without fuel, entire units of the German army were forced to abandon their vehicles. For them, the game was up. Berlin was still to be taken, but with the Allies closing in for the kill, the strategic bombing campaign was over. The B-17 had done its job. By May the 7th, 1945, as Germany surrendered, it had lost 95% of its fuel industry. Its war machine had ground to a halt. Just over a thousand days of combat, the 8th Air Force had used up 99 million rounds of ammunition and destroyed 18,810 enemy aircraft. Of the 1.5 million tons of bombs dropped by all Allied aircraft in Europe, the B-17 Flying Fortress accounted for almost a third. The aeroplane that had crashed during testing back in 1937 and was almost never built had become a war winner and a legend in combat history. 17s came back with some of the most horrible damage you've ever seen, almost broken in two, some of them, but they'd get back and they'd land. They could take more punishment, I think, than any other bomber aircraft. Well, I think it was a wonderful airplane, and it took a heck of a lot of beating. And if it hadn't been for a B-17, I more likely wouldn't be sitting here talking to you because it couldn't have been any other aircraft, and I more likely have been dead. 12,000 B-17s were built. 250,000 men had flown them in Europe, and more than 46,500 American airmen had been killed or wounded. The B-17 Flying Fortress had lived up to its billing. Despite the losses, it had proved itself to be a durable and dependable aircraft, one that had extracted a high price in combat, helping to end German resistance in the Second World War. I don't think we could have won it without the B-17 or something by another name that did the same thing that a B-17 did. And there was no other plane at the time that could do that. Everyone that I've known that flew in a B-17 was just proud as punch about the, the unit in its entirety. It's a good engine, it's a good unit. <laughs> It's a good plane. The epitaph, if there is one, it should be that this is the best airplane bomber that ever flew in World War II. My testimony. Oh, I thought I wanted to be a pilot, but uh, my problem was that I was uh, got out of high school and I went to work. And uh, and 
Well, well, I was working in a factory at night and going. Uh, I worked the eleven to seven shift, and I went to col went to night college in the in the evening from six to ten, and I wanted to be a I wanted to be a chemical engineer. This was my thoughts. I wanted to, so I took a lot of mathematics, and in high school I, I went through the whole spectrum, college algebra, trigonometry, advanced algebra, all that kind of stuff. So when I took the test. I wanted to be a pilot. I think everybody went in wanting to be a pilot. And I really, when I was classified as navigator, I didn't have the slightest idea what a navigator was supposed to do on an airplane. And uh, then there was the bombardiers too. But uh, I think most of us were happy that we were going to be a, a officer, number one, and fly as a navigator. And when we were trained, I couldn't believe when they told us what we we're going to have to do, how we can learn that in a period of, I don't think, from January until September, which is a very short period of time, all the stuff. But the service did a wonderful job of training, and of course we were all very receptive to that. I know there were a lot of bum navigators, but there are a lot of good navigators too, and, uh, and I think the story is, if you're here to talk about it and you got back, you must have been a pretty good navigator. That's about the way it goes, you know. Well, I had three St. Christopher's medals because my sister was training. She was a Navy nurse in World War II at a Catholic hospital, and so I had three French nuns praying for me. But I also had a rabbit's foot, and the priest asked me when I came back, which got you back? And I said, I don't know, and he about ready to kill me. I guess. <laughs> but I don't know. Uh, they, I, was, I think flyers are all kind of superstitious. and. Friday the 13th, I, I, I don't think, I really had an aversion to Friday the 13th, and I can't remember to this day if I ever flew on Friday the 13th. But uh, I have always said, uh, being as young as we were, um, we were too dumb to feel the fear. We were there too young to feel the fear, and uh, it all depends what you wanted to do. And we were volunteers. Until later in the war, and I don't think anybody realized that at the end, I went in in 1942, and in the end of 1943, President Roosevelt gave an edict that you could not volunteer for the service, that you would be drafted, and they would put you where they felt you should go. And a lot of guys went into the cadets who were drafted because they were qualified to go into that area there. But I think being volunteers, you know, we knew, uh, and, and, and we, we, I was in high school in the 30s, late 30s and 40s, and we were re reading the magazines from Great Britain about the Battle of Britain and all that, and we all knew when we were in high school that we were going to go to war. Anybody would be kidding himself if they didn't. I thought so, and I think all my friends thought so too. So we had to decide what, if they were going to go to war, what were you going to do? And I had two uncles. My folks came from Czechoslovakia in 1912, and my two uncles had already been back, were back in France in 1917. And one was gassed and one was in the artillery, but I didn't want to do that. I knew that, I, and I didn't want to be on the ground. So you just had to make up your mind. A lot of guys didn't. A lot of them waited till we were drafted, and I didn't want to be drafted. I just went ahead and volunteered very quickly. Well, there again, this prior to going overseas in January 1944, our group was, they, what they did, they trained you as provisional groups. And you went over singularly flying your airplanes over, somewhat over by ship. And then you formed, you were parceled out to various groups. And I think I'm alive today because of other happenings, because we were flying out, over, out of Tennessee at that time, at Dyersburg, Tennessee. And in December, prior to January of our collision, we were flying out of the Gulf, over the Gulf of Mexico in a gunnery mission. They had P-47s coming at us, and the gunners were practicing, you know, trying to lead them. And my bombardier and I looked off to the left, and here were two B-17s that had collided. And we saw one cut the other one in half, and the tail go one way, the plane go another way, and the other plane go to the right. And we looked out. So all these fellows falling out of the waist with no parachutes. And uh, to tell you the truth, it scared the devil us out of us. We start shaking. And uh, 
we were really the only plane that got back to our base, and maybe a couple of others that ever just scattered like a bunch of sheep. And we had chest packs. We had chest packs, and the navigator put his chest pack underneath the desk. Pilots had him behind his seat, or he could have had a backpack on. And when I got back, I went to Air Force Supply, and I said, I want a backpack parachute. And now that's, like I said, it could have been, it was a message. And three weeks later, we were flying in a formation then, coming back again from, we did these gunnery missions over the Gulf of Mexico. And we were a lead squad. We were called a select crew. My pilot was an excellent pilot. And so I had transferred off a previous crew onto his crew. And we were leading the formation back from the Gulf back to Tennessee at about 19,000 feet. And the crew I had previously been on was flying to our left, on our left side. And for some reason, and I, I will never know why, he, I think we they were taught, practice and change in position. He came, the plane came underneath us, and I think, well, I'm just saying, I'm not a pilot, but it must have caught our prop wash and start coming up. And I looked down, I saw a great big airplane, heard a lot of noise, and next thing I knew, I was out in the air. But I had a backpack parachute. And the thing, as they say about my pilot, what saved our life, when the planes hit, instead of pushing the throttles forward, my pilot pushed the throttles back. So we went backwards, and he went forward, and we cut his tail off, and he went down. And to add color to it's not color, but the, the ball turret gunner got out of the ball and came up to the front with a walk-around bottle and left his parachute in the back. He was there with me. We weren't flying a bombardier that day. And he got tossed out too, but he got tossed on the wing of the aircraft. And the pilot rang the bailout bell, looked to his left, and here's a guy standing amongst the wreckage, and that's a fact. And we had an old F model and had the springs on the, on the machine gun. Somehow it caught in his pants. The guy's standing up there on the wing, and he looks out there, and the plane was going to the left into a spin, and he righted the aircraft in notion to him to start coming. The slipstream brought him back, and by some way they brought him through the left-hand pilot's window with his fur flying suit on. I don't know how they got him out. Well, the plane, this way, I really love the air. That plane had no nose. The, my engineer said, you know, the propellers missed you by about eight inches, but when the plane went up like this, I went sailing back to the firewall and hit the fuse box and cut my back, and then when the plane went into a spin, I went sailing out of the Dalgon airplane, but I had a parachute. and. Uh, when I went out, all I had on was a th when a parachute opened, I had my throat mic, I lost my hat, I lost my fur boots, I did have my gloves on, and we were at about 18 or 19,000 feet. And when the parachute opened, it took all the wind out. I thought I was going to die, but I kept, and it was on a clear day, a very, very clear day. There's absolutely no reason why. But my pilot brought that plane back without the nose, the hydraulic system's gone, couldn't hardly see the instruments. Pull the guy through the window. The flight engineer, who was a substitute that day, looked at the instruments. They were all red line. He had a complete nervous breakdown. So he had two people on the plane. So he radioed the crew and he said, I'm going to bring this, I got to bring this back. I had two guys without chutes in the plane. He said, You can bail out or I'll bring the plane back. And they went with Fred Heiser and Fred brought the damn thing in perfectly. They didn't even know it was him. And of course, the other plane, when, the, when we cut the tail off, it started going down. And I, I actually, when I, my chute opened, all I could see is smoke on the ground. I didn't really see the plane going down. But two people survived. The B-17, when the B-17, well, well, I saw this in combat, when it got shot up, it'd go down like a falling leaf, just like that. And every once in a while, it'd go up like that. Well, centrifugal force is so great in those airplanes, you couldn't lift your hand. He had one shot, when it goes like that, you could see parachutes coming out of the doggone airplane. Then it'd go down again, depending, and until it hit the ground, you know, or it broke up or blew up. But that made me convinced that a V-17 could take a heck of a lot of punishment, because when you saw the thing on the ground, you couldn't believe it. There was no nose on the airplane, but he brought the plane back. 
it had to be a damn tough airplane on that. But like I say, the only thing happened to me, I spent about two and a half months in the hospital because the doctor said, don't they teach, teach kids how to bail out of an airplane? And I said, well, he said, what'd you do? And I said, well, I don't know what I did, but I pulled my ripcord too soon. And I guess I was going about like a bomb, maybe 180, 200 miles an hour. So when the thing opened, it tore my shoulder all up. And other than that, and they wired me back together, and, and I went overseas with about three months later with another crew. But without your pack, pack parachutes on? Well, without the pack, yeah, that, that had a, well, I say the sign was when we saw the other planes collide and saw those people falling out without parachutes, convinced me. And, of course, my crew kidded me then for about two or three weeks. You know, why are you wearing that doggone parachute like that? I said, well... Say what you want to do, but I'm going to wear that parachute like that. And it saved my life because I wouldn't have had a shot. In combat, we wore chest packs, but I had a parachute cord from a parachute. I went to supply and tied it on my harness and tied it on the parachute thing. So if it did occur, I'd be able to get the thing in and snap it on me. But after that, I mean, you get a little goosey, to say the least about how you're going to get out of that airplane. But it, it really wouldn't have bothered me if I had had a bailout again. Of course, I didn't bail out. I got tossed out. I would have done it. 